Hello, my and more brothers back again. Uh, it's been a minute since I actually uploaded anything. I've been on so many people's live streams, man, and put in so many hours. I'm sitting on people's panels, man, that I forget that I have a channel that I have to upload content on to kind of keep the algorithm and my subscribers engaged. I tell Dr. Johnson and, and a bunch of other folks about uploading regularly to keep engagement up. And um, I'm failing to do that myself. But that being said, I just wanted to kind of talk a minute about something that's been bugging me over the past, I would say, year or so. Actually, more than that. And that is the conversation about civil rights and pre-civil rights and post-civil rights. Because I get the, what I call, what do they call them? The folks that want to go back to a previous time, the conservatives, uh, so-called conservatives that actually want to go back to pre-civil rights because they said that the black family was stronger and we had a better time because we had more businesses and you know yada 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 right and then the the, the the folks that say that civil rights was actually bad for black folks and we have it worse after civil rights than we had before and it normally comes from you know basically people that are actually kind of what they call late gen xers at the at the bottom and, and probably even uh, millennials. Millennials really have a bad time with this stuff about saying that we were better before civil rights and uh, civil rights folks and boomers actually caused us to be in a worse state. And I hear it all the time and it frustrates me, right? Because because there's no there's no logic to it. OK, it's just scattered around and thrown around and, and talk about failure. And I think that's a lot of because of what they call boomer hate because they want to throw shade on the boomer so bad that they're willing to ignore history right so it was a good discussion and i'm gonna put the link in the description about with the roger report and malcolm versus martin which is i mean it's not new but the thing is back when i was a kid and back when they were alive i'd never heard that one versus the other in fact most of my life i never heard the malcolm versus martin ideal malcolm and martin were always venerated they always were when i was coming up and i was i'm a you know i'm, I'm a boomer so i'm a child kid in the 60s and and, and I'm, a, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s and i never heard that but all of a sudden it's one versus the other and i was coming up it was never one versus the other you needed both of them we didn't have enough of them we needed more malcolm x's because we mourned him we mourned his death when he died there was no black folks that actually cheered when malcolm x died you know, uh, there were riots when, when Malcolm X died. I think part of the L.A. riots was because of uh, Malcolm X's death, because people were frustrated because Malcolm was a beloved character. He was. He was beloved, uh, beloved. You know, people like people like Malcolm. In fact, that's how come the Nation of Islam got his biggest boost under Malcolm, because he was beloved. Just like the uh, people believe that Martin Luther King, that Malcolm was preferred over Martin Luther King. He wasn't. And people believe that most people didn't mark rock with Martin Luther King. And that's not true. And, and there's one question that I asked uh, Art, Art Newstyle yesterday, because, you know, he's a he's not he's Gen Xer. But the thing is, he's been around older women, you know, old grandmothers. He was at, he was uh, around at a time before Barack Obama. Right. And I always say that, you know, you go to an old black woman's house. 90% of the time, what are you going to see in the parlor or in the living room? What what three pictures will you always see? And he named them. Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, and Jesus. Old Northern women, old Southern women saw the same thing, right? That shows you that the vast majority of people were behind the civil rights. Did they participate? No. Were they behind it? Yes. And that's just anecdotal. I came up. There was nobody that I know of that I even heard of that was anti-civil rights. There was nobody I ever heard of when I was coming up. Nobody in the South, people from the North, people in Los Angeles, people in the West. Nobody ever heard of said they were willing to go back to the 50s, pre-civil rights. Nobody. So when I hear people talking about re retrospective history, sometimes it does piss me off. Right. Because one, they didn't live through the period. Number two, they're making presumptions about what it was like before, before civil rights. And that's always without civil rights, we would have done better. We would have uh, developed more businesses. We'd have we'd have um, 
had stronger families, we'd have been yada, 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 right? All this projection, right? So we're talking about Malcolm and Martin, and we're talking about the differences between them. And it gets on to the point of civil rights, right? And, you know, and Roger, shout out to Roger, because this is his opinion, you know, I'm sure he's talked to people and he's formed this opinion that we mishandled civil rights. And that's fair. OK, he says it's mishandled. He said it might have been a necessary cause, but we think he, we dropped the ball and we mis mishandled it and we could have done something better. So, though, I, even though I have angst about it, so I took off my red pill hat and I put on my black pill hat. I said, OK, that's fair. Since you said we mishandled it and we dropped the ball, what would you have done differently? And there's always a pause and there's always silence. And then there was, there's there was always, well, we should have had brought uh, black people together and started buying from each other and started work with each other, basically come together in, in force and actually done something right or actually push for uh, these a lot more things to be implemented. I said, OK, that's fair. Okay, so how are you going to bring all these people together that weren't together? Because we weren't together. And what would, what would you have asked for to be implemented that wasn't done? In other words, you do, you disagree with what was done in the civil rights. Okay, what well, what would you have done differently? And I have to give him credit. He has. He said he doesn't know. And most guys would have argued back and forth and given me platitudes and, and theories and stuff like that. No, give me a, give me the plan where civil rights went wrong and what they should have done differently. What strategy, what tactics, uh, what they should have asked for, uh, what kind of family formation should they have pushed for, all that kind of stuff. What should they have done differently? And nobody could answer because 90% of the people, the only, per only person I could think of that, that kind of, uh, that, was, that actually did live through the period because he's silent generation and was that actually did participate, which is Claude Anderson. So I have to give him his due respect because he he was an administrator. He did live through the period. He was active in it and he had vital concerns, even though I've never heard a clear cut plan about what he would have done differently and how he would have handled white people under that, um, under those plans, because it's fine if we're out there in the middle of nowhere and white folks would just say, you know, those are those Negroes over there. And we don't care what they do. So how they form themselves and how they apply themselves and what they do with their own community, it's up to them. That was never true and still isn't. You can only work within the bounds of what you're given, right? And basically, white people, the white structure of the United States has very clear ideas about what they wanted out of the Negro race. The, the businesses, as I told them, the businesses, and it was actually verified in the Kerner commissions, were failing because... People were migrating from where they were. OK, the jobs that they used to have, which is basically farming, which was basically rural. Those jobs were being industrialized. They were being taken away. All the manual labor jobs that black folks, especially black men, earned their living doing were being taken away by machines. They had to be industrialized. They had to move to urban centers where the jobs were. Because that's between 1950 and 1965 or 1967, when the Kerner Commission was being written, that's what was causing the congestion in the urban areas, in the urban black areas, and what we call the ghettos. OK, there wasn't just the northern ghettos that we look at. It was also the southern ghettos It's because people were migrating from the outlying areas into the interior areas looking for jobs. And there weren't any. So if people don't have jobs. Guess what businesses don't have? They don't have money which was the biggest reason for a lot of black businesses going, guess what, out of business. And when they moved to those urban areas, guess what was already there? They were already established, white businesses. So a lot of black people were going to white businesses out of out of uh, necessity because there wasn't enough black businesses that were already established. This is something that the Kerner Commission says, which nobody reads, okay? Which I didn't even read until... Art of Itmore says we needed to go in that project and find out exactly what happened, right? Because it was a it was a very broad study over about a year commissioned by the Johnson administration. And it had, it had some like 15,000 people working on it. So it wasn't a small study. It was a very large study. Spent a lot of money doing it. 
to look at uh, black people's problems, especially urban black folks' problems, so they wouldn't happen again, right? Uh, policing, jobs, housing, education, welfare, family formation, and look at everything. What I always notice is black folks think that there was no external forces on black people, that like the black people existed in some kind of uh, independent bubble. And black folks are just out in what they call Black Mayberry in little bitty towns where you had a black sheriff and you had black businesses and black Opie and black Andy went to the fishing hole every other day to go fishing and sit around in this idyllic area where, you know, you didn't have uh, Klansmen and white folks and in the United States imposing on your on your rights. Everybody was well fed, well dressed, uh, well groomed. And it was just an oasis. And every black person I talked that talked to was far from the truth. In fact, Richard Williams said, you know, when he said he left Louisiana and went to Chicago, he said there was more racism in Chicago than there was in Louisiana. And he was in the, he came from the Jim Crow South. He came from the Jim Crow South in the fifties, and he went from uh, from South from South Southern Louisiana to uh, Northern Louisiana to. Uh, Chicago. And that's the same thing I heard from not only people on the ground, but people that lived on the ground, what I experienced because my family moved from racist Texas to uh, segregated Los Angeles. And I was lucky because I, I had a working father and a working mother. And I can tell you uh, if the, the golden age of, of black folks in the 50, you know, in, we think of in the 50s and the 60s didn't happen. And even though civil rights legislation was passed in the 60s and integration started on a small scale in the 50s and 60s. Integration didn't happen till the 70s and 80s. In fact, in integration didn't accelerate till the 90s because I was one of those pilot kid, pilot program kids in the 1960s going to a white school. They had this little clutch of, of black kids going in, into a 90% white school district where there were clear markers between where black folks could go in Los Angeles. And LA was went far more liberal than the South was. And I heard the stories that my aunts and my uncles and my grandmother talked about, about living in the South, okay? That shit wasn't pretty, okay? And then I go back to the books, to the stats, where black folks say we were doing well. 80% of black folks, over 80% of black folks were in poverty. And what we call poverty back then. Most black folks were in abject poverty. Most black folks were not well fed. OK, you didn't see fat people down south. OK, like that. <laughs> black folks back then were skinny. You didn't you know, you didn't have this this, this feast uh, of, of dinner every day. OK, they're very humble meals. So I don't get where uh, all of a sudden uh, black folks are doing worse. Black folks have more calories, eat more, uh, have better housing than they've ever had. Most black folks didn't have cars back then. That was just reflective of the whole population. But the thing is, um, there are a lot of things black folks did not have. Now, after civil rights, we started acquiring more things. My father got be my father got a better job after uh, civil rights. My father was a cook was still before civil rights. OK, he was a cook. He was short order cook with a limited ed education. Right. He got a better job after civil rights. After 1968, 69, my father got a better job. My uncle got a better job. The black men around me got better jobs. I was afforded a better education. We had more opportunities in the military, in school, more grants, more scholarships, better books. OK, they were building new high schools in black areas after 1968 uh, in, in Los Angeles. They got uh, they had two new black high schools built in 1968, right after the Kerner Commission and right after riots. Right. One on one on what we call the east side over in Watts and one over in the Crenshaw district, Crenshaw High School. And I, I'm trying to remember the other high school that was actually built brand new, brand spanking new after the 1968 riots, because the, all the other black high schools where black areas where high schools were, were falling apart. He had a lot of trade schools and skill centers opening up to actually give more black people skills, teach them trades. OK, the unions opened up. The aircraft, the, the auto industry and the aircraft industry uh, opened up to give 
a whole lot of people black uh, better jobs. Uh, Carson, California, uh, most of those black folks that moved to those upscale areas with those big, those bigger homes and nicer areas, right? Guess where most of those black parents actually worked? They worked for the defense industry and they literally built up uh, uh, middle class neighborhoods from uh, from that, from working in there. Uh, they actually started buying houses in Compton in middle class areas. They started living in the suburbs because they had more money, had more economic access. And I saw the change because I was part of the change. So, so to say that black folks were better off before civil rights, I call bullshit. And people that I ask that say that, they can't prove it. They think that uh, we went from Emmett Till to, to basically uh, integration, or we call integration, or civil rights, would have been a straight line without it. Man, you had, you had a major upheaval, okay? You had people assassinated because they were asking for things that, that white folks didn't want to give. You had people, you had 323 riots between 19, I think it was 1962 and 1972. You had 300 some odd riots. The black folks are doing so well. What are they rioting for? It wasn't just in the North they were rioting. It was in the South they were rioting too. You didn't have police reforms until after 1968. Under, look at the current commission. They were talking about all the police reforms that were actually implemented that still exist today. You didn't have that. In the 1950s, uh, white folks could just come into your neighborhood, get who they want and go kill them. No questions asked. Okay. After the civil rights, you don't have that anymore. I asked black folks, I said, can they go into your house, steal you out, murder you and get away with it? No, just that alone. Just that alone is worth the price of civil rights to me. Do you still have sundown towns? Do you still have racism? Yeah. Do you still have Karens? Like the, like a lot of, you know, black folks that challenge Karens nowadays, they think it's so common. I should take up a, a, a camera and shine it on Karen and have something done about it. Okay. And they think this is just overt racism. 1950s, hell, even in the 60s, you would have never even challenged Karen. Karen would have said something, you would have ran your little black, black ass out away from her as quickly as you can because you know the cops are going to be coming and they weren't going to ask no questions. And there were three bad things that were going to happen to you if you didn't move and you didn't get away. And hopefully she didn't get a good look at you. So I know how black folks want to be proud. You know, they, they want to uh, look at their past and look at it with some kind of pride. And the fact that we survived should be pride enough because the Native Americans didn't. That's the way that uh, America wants you to be. They don't, you know, uh, Native Americans are like, what, 70 million when they got here? They're less than they're about a million now. The vast majority of Native Americans are gone. And the ones that still exist are so mixed that you can't tell that they're Native Americans anymore. Now, for whatever uh, forces or reasons where I think that they needed black folks for labor, which is why it didn't happen to us, that is called forced integration. And forced integration, white folks didn't even like forced integration. That is something that the, that the United States government is imposing upon both sides. White folks do not want you to integrate with them. Why do you think there's such a thing that is called white flight? Why do you think that they were bombarding the buses with rocks? You think white folks want you to integrate? The, the, the regular white folks want you to integrate with them? No. This is forced by the our, our, our rulers, by our handlers, by the government, federal, state, and local. It's forced and paid for by them. They want you to mix. And that's what you have to negotiate. Yeah, we'll get we'll get Billy Bob to stop lynching you. Yeah, we'll give you access to jobs. We'll give you access to better education. We'll give you protections. We'll give you all those things. But guess what you need to do? You need to integrate into the United States. That's the deal. That's the deal that you cut. You're not going to get something for nothing. But white folks and white structures not benevolent like that. They're not. They're not benign like that. We get pissed off because uh Monaghan talked about benign neglect. In other words, leaving you on your own. We get pissed off at that. So the people that believe we were actually better off before civil rights and we could have handled it, civil rights differently. Don't just talk. Don't just give me the platitudes. Don't just give me these ideals. Give me a bullet points and a working plan that could actually work. You know, that the United States government would actually accept because you have to get them to accept it because you don't have the power to impose it. 
ask the South. They had the right to secede from the, from the Union. They had the right to secede from the Union. It was in the Constitution. It was in the Federalist Papers. They had the right to succeed, secede from the Union. They had the right to leave, okay? And they tried to leave. And guess what Lincoln did? He came down and fought a civil war to bring them back. If white people did not have the right to separate from the Union, even though it was legally mandated, it is actually legally in the Constitution, and they can't do it. Why do you think black folks who were at the time were less than 10% of the country, less than 10% of the most powerful country on the planet, still today, we're going to legally be able to separate and, and take away six or seven states. I think at the time it was five. They wanted 10% of the states to legally separate. How are you going to impose that? How are you going to even get that to pass and nobody else could? They're just going to give it to you. And I think Art actually read it at the it, at the toward the end of the um, of the piece, uh, Art actually read from the final call what Muslim wanted, what what the Nation of Islam wanted, right? As black people, what they actually wanted, right? And just about everything on that list was already done, including a state for black people separated that we that uh, we didn't actually uh, legally fight for like we should have. Was Oklahoma was as black and Indian territory, which by the way, Black Wall Street was located in on a pool of oil with resources, right? You know, which is which is a home, which is in the States and abroad, which is Liberia. Liberia has been carved out and bought for black folks since, what, 17, 1790, if I'm not mistaken. The American Colonial Society actually uh, established uh, and bought and established Liberia for black people like almost 200 years ago. And black folks never pushed to take advantage of it. That was never talked about. That was never pushed. That was never brought up. That was never circulated because that was not the will of the black people in, at the time. You can't do something that's against the will of black folks, right? If black folks don't want to do it, is that them dropping the ball? Is that civil rights trying to force people to do something that they, that they don't want to do? Go back and read the Monaghan Report. Go back and read the Kerner Commission. Monaghan's job was to uh, take the, the black family, the black people, to integrate them into the families uh, of, of the United States. Integrate them. Assimilate them. That's the, that's the government's job, to assimilate you into the society. Give you the tools that you need so you become a citizen just like everybody else. And Moynihan said the same thing. Now Johnson said the same thing. You gave them civil rights, now you have to give them economic rights. Okay, What black folks were asking for White folks, uh, white liberals were willing to give them. The black folks, the boomers, Xers, even today, millennials fight hard enough for the same kind of rights that are already on the books. Are you doing that? Civil rights was a beginning, not an ending. Civil rights was a beginning of a new era, not an ending of the era. It started the ball rolling. Boomers didn't shut uh, millennials off or shut Generation Xers off from anything. They have just as much access. In fact, Generation X, millennials have way more access than, than I could tell you that boomers ever did. Way more access to stuff. Way more access to, to markets, to loans, to stock markets, to, uh, to living, you know, uh, uh, housing, okay? Does it cost? Yes, it does, but you have access, okay? There are places in the United States you can move that's cheap. You can uh, it, it, you have far more ability to actually start a business, start a corporation and, and start a start businesses than any other time in black history. Right. Look how many billionaires you got. OK, uh, we think Rihanna, who, who makes her money in the United States, is considered black. Just turned a billionaire. Kanye West, Kanye West, a billionaire. OK, Oprah, a billionaire. Robert Smith, a billionaire. Are they entertainers? Some are entertainers, some aren't. There's things that we can do that we that we're still shut off from. But the thing is, you had you you didn't even have a chance to do that back then. You got thousands of black banks that we don't participate in or with that you didn't have a chance to even open back then. You have you have access to international markets that you didn't have access to back then. You have all you have this whole planet that's opened up. That's been that you've been given access to, been given keys to doors, keys to rooms that you've never had before. But you're not better off. You might be right. I beg to differ. You look at the education of black boys. Okay, 
is it partially white people's fault? Yes, it is. But you also got, but nobody is not giving you the ability to teach your own children. There are libraries within walking distance. In fact, nowadays, the internet, you can get any book at any time from anywhere and sit down with your kid and read. You have an internet full of, of, of teaching programs for free on YouTube that can facilitate you learning anything. So how come only 10% of your black boys can read at level? Because nobody cares. It's not important to them. All black boys should graduate high school, regardless of, of their station, especially since high school has been dumbed down. It's not that hard to graduate. All you got to do is do the work. Show up, do the work. Hell, they even, they even feed you in school. We didn't have lunch programs, you know, when I was a kid, okay? When I was going to, to, to uh, uh, elementary school, we didn't have a lunch program. Lunch programs didn't start till after the, until the 70s. Well, they actually gave you uh, lunch programs. Well, what actually give you money to eat, give you a ticket so you go to the cafeteria and get something to eat. That didn't exist till, till after the civil rights, okay? In fact, uh, they were just saying it's done under, under COVID, okay? If the school, the school has gotten so uh, good at actually teaching and feeding kids, they said that uh, most kids wouldn't have, uh, would only have one meal a day if they didn't go to school. They wouldn't have the standard three meals a day. This is how much things have changed. I had a video that Hezekiah uh, News actually put up, man, where they had a black family. I think it was in, I think it was in Missouri. I'm not sure exactly where it was, right? Where there was so little food that the that the woman carrying the baby lost her baby because she didn't have enough nutrition. She didn't have enough to eat. The kids didn't have enough to eat. That was our past. Look at that. Look at that video. That's what that was our past. Those are people from that time telling you exactly how it was. And the people that are now making things up about how it was back then uh, in the in the in the uh, 60s and 70s that are actually making things up. They don't look at that kind of stuff. They think this is just a one off that this this wasn't representative of most black people. Come on. Anyway, let me jump off of here and stop ranting and stop wandering and meandering, okay? Before it gets too long. This is BGS out and I'll see you guys.